opened up our text, and I'm going to invite you to do that again today. We want to have that text in front of us the entire time. So um, turn, there, turn there with me, if you will. <clears throat> and as we look at that text, we want to remember the things that we were talking about last week. Just by way of recap, we were seeing that before we can begin to discuss what most people want to know, which is, well, what are the days of the creation? Is it a six-day, 24-hour, literal, you know, kind of thing? Or is it longer or whatever? We have to step back and say, why was Genesis 1 and 2 written? Which, of course, as we said, raised the question, why was the book of Genesis written? Well, it's part of the Pentateuch. Why was the Pentateuch written? And so on. And what we saw, of course, is that Moses wrote these things under the inspiration of the Spirit. So what he was writing is indeed the Word of God and is intended not just for those people at that time, but intended for all people in all ages, which is going to be a very important point when we begin to discuss what it's actually saying. But in order to understand what God intends for all people in all ages, we have to begin to understand what it meant for those people then. And as we saw, it is in fact meant for a people who had just been redeemed out of Egypt, who had been brought into the, uh, the wilderness in a time of preparation before they would enter into the promised land. So this is absolutely key. God has moved the, uh, Moses to write this, to inform these people of who they are, why God redeemed them, why they are God's special people. And so he gives a history, a history lesson. This is who you are. You are the sons of Israel, Jacob. Well, who was Jacob? The son of Isaac. Who was Isaac? The son of Abraham. Who is Abraham? The one that God called. Why did God have to call a people for himself? Then you go into the primeval history. Well, because God created everything, and we messed everything up, and so on and so on and so on. So that's why the book was written. And when we read the first couple of chapters, we came away last week with a conclusion that said that it presents three things. It shows that this is a great God, a God who is one God, unlike all those pagan creation myths where there are multiple deities, weak deities, as a matter of fact, fighting amongst themselves, and that's how the world is created as the overflow of their fight or, or whatever. There's always, you know, some strange stuff. No, the Genesis 1 and 2 account is majestic in showing one God, a strong God, who creates all things. The other second thing that we saw was that mankind is central to the creation that he is not something left over as in most of those creation myths of the time, the Babylonian, the Syrian, so on, the Egyptian. And the third thing that comes out of it is if everything is created good, then the world is messed up because of us, which actually comes in the next chapter, chapter three of Genesis. You see, in creation accounts, again, in the pagan world, they tried to show that the world from the beginning was chaotic and messed up, because they look around, they see it that way, and they imagine, how, why did it become that way? And they, and they wrap that into their creation myth. But what we saw here was, there's a great God who created everything good. Man is central in that creation, but man is also the one responsible for ruining all that was good. So that's what we saw last time. So we're going to dive right in today, and we're going to begin to look at different ways in which we can interpret what Genesis 1 and 2 is actually saying. But we have to do it in the framework of what I just said, what it's really trying to do. Is it trying to answer our questions about science and all that? Or is it trying to come from a position of talking about God redeeming his people and why? So with that in mind, let's take a look at our positions. And before I just start listing some of the more common ones, we have some categories that we need to wrestle with. Ways that we can interpret the different views, and there are multiple amount of views. One thing I want to point out, though, is that in our denomination, as in most conservative denominations, there is a whole range of views about how creation happened and what Genesis 1 and 2 says about it. But, and this is not to scale, but there's only a broad, I'm sorry, a narrow spectrum of what's actually allowable. 
So for example, historically, historically in the last 150 years, the idea of, let's say, theistic evolution, the fact that there has been evolution on a macro scale and that it uh, was guided by God has traditionally fallen outside of what is accepted by uh, different denominations like the Orthodox Presbyterian Church or any of the other conservative Reformed churches. I have to say that right now that's on the cusp. And there's reasons why that, and we'll talk about that. And I'm going to do my level best to show you why that belongs outside the pale of acceptable views. But we have to start with the understanding that there is a range of views. And within that range, there are four big ones. And those are the ones we're going to spend time looking at today and unpacking next week. Oh, and, and in addition to those four, there's a whole multitude of little ones. And I don't think we're going to have, if this were a full semester long class, we'd go through them and give each one their 15 minutes and take them down. But we don't even have time for that. But before we can deal with those, we do want to look at categories that help us to understand. These are not actual views themselves, but these are categories that I want you to think about as we think about these views. So let's go ahead. I'm going to write these categories. Then we're going to come back to our text and read it. I still want to read our text again because that was last week when we last read it. But now you know what it is that the passages Genesis 1 and 2 are actually trying to promote. We looked at it already, those three things. The one great strong God, man central to creation, man responsible for messing up creation. Then I want you to look at these categories I'm about to put up here. And then you start forming your own opinions. Okay, so think of these as poles, different ways that you can look at things. So on one pole, you can have purely religious, or let's just call it on this side, historical. So in this poll, it says there are some views that purport that that Genesis 1 and 2 is just presenting a religious view. It's just simply there to communicate to us that, that God is one and great and powerful. But in no way is it trying to give us a historical view of what actually happened. So that's one category, one set of, uh, of polls that you can think of for looking at different views. Does it purport to be religious? This is purport to be historical. By the way, you can actually have both, but these are categories under which we can begin uh, to think about the different views. Another set of polls is whether it is scientific, or maybe to make it simple, I'm just gonna say, or not. <laughs> These are, these are slightly different, but this one says Genesis 1 and 2 is communicating scientific fact to us. It is communicating to us theory. It is communicating, well, not, maybe not theory, but some scientific fact that, can, that we can study and look at. Some will say, no, it's not. There's, that's not at all in what we're dealing with. So that's another way of looking at the views. Those views that fall under, there's some level of scientific information or there's no level of scientific information being presented. And then there's a last set of polls that we want to look at. And uh, I'm just gonna call this for now concordist. I'm out of room. Okay, so I'm going to call it on this side the concordist view or a non-concordist view. What does that mean? To concord means to match up. Now, this is very similar to this, but it's not quite. This basically says this view of trying to understand Genesis 1 and 2 is not only trying to explain the text, but it's trying to explain the text in a way that concords with scientific theory of today. You see how that works? This side says, no, we don't care to try to match it with scientific theory of the day. Now, these are not the same. You could say, my understanding of Genesis 1 and 2 is that it presents real science. However, the science that I read in Genesis 1 and 2 does not at all have anything to do with what scientists are saying today. In which case, you would say, I believe that it's science, but that science, since it doesn't match up, 
it's a non-concordist view. You guys see how that works? So any questions about these three poles? Because that's what I want us to see as we read through the text. All good? All right. So let's go ahead and grab Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, actually, let's just focus today on Genesis 1. We'll look at a little bit of 2 later. 2, um, just because we don't have the time to delve into it. Uh, chapter 2 is not a new creation account. Let me just throw that out there. There's always, you know, folks who are um, loose in their understanding of Scripture. Oh, that's a second creation account. No, it's not. What it does is it takes day 6, the creation of man. It zooms in, think of a movie editor, and, and it recapitulates, and then it shows in detail what happens with the creation of man and the creation of woman is all laid out in there in detail. We will have time and opportunity to uh, jump in there and, and peck away at different things. Like, what does it mean that Eve was created out of Adam's rib? We'll talk about, is that real? Is that mythological? Is that um, uh, just an analogy, an allegory to show that she's equal and she comes out of the side? Or did it actually happen? We'll, we'll spend some time there. But for now, let's go ahead and read Genesis uh, 1. Do I have someone who is brave enough to read the whole chapter? Please, if you would, Peter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth
and subdue it. And have to be, you know, the fish of the sea and over the birds and the heavens and over everything, every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth. And even and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps in the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning. The sixth day. All right, thank you, Peter. Actually, I'm going to read the next uh, three, uh, next four verses, uh, because actually that's where the account continues. So it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And then there's this very interesting line as we, as we jump into the second account. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens, uh, the earth and the heavens. What's interesting about that verse, chapter 2, verse 4, is that that refrain, these are the generations of, are repeated again and again throughout Genesis as different stories or different, they're like, uh, like markers in when, when Moses is trying to say, okay, now we're going to shift. So these are the generations of, and then he lays out, for example, Abraham. These are the generations of. Everything else is meant to be historical. The same language is used here. This is meant to be historical. And as we read the text, and thank you, Peter, for reading it, as we read that text, you could see there the majesty of God. This is not a God who was in combat with other gods and the leftover, you know, his left leg wasn't cut off and the blood of it populated and made, you know, humankind. This was a deliberate God in control of his creation, a God who is not his creation, not equal with his creation. It is a creator who is distinct. He created the world good, even at the end saying it was very good. And in so creating, he put man at the front, made him, he's the crown of creation, the last day, gave him dominion as vice regent over all of the creation. So that's all very clear as we go through the text. But now, I need to ask you the question, using some of these categories, is this a religious text without historical information? Or is it historical? I'm giving you already one big clue. Chapter 2, verse 4, these other generations is exactly what you see all throughout uh, the book of Genesis. Is it scientific or is it not? Is it attempting to concord with uh, modern scientific theories, current scientific thought, or is it not? And with that in mind, let's go ahead and turn to the views and we'll begin to weigh them. But before we do, any questions about what we've seen so far? Yes, Timothy. Can you, um, can you kind of differentiate what you mean between religious and historical? Because you have historically religious... Yes, it's just, yeah, as I was saying, you can actually fall into both camps, but there are some who will argue that there is nothing but religious information and that it's not conveying any real truth in terms of uh, historical accurate, you know, accuracy. Um, so, for example, you might have those who say, look, it presents Adam and Eve, and, and there's guys like John Walton, who is uh, an evangelical theologian, uh, is arguing that, for example, Adam and Eve uh, may have been historical or may not have been, but at the very least, they are no more than um, archetypes. So they really weren't really the, the, um, the first humans. They were just representative of what happened to mankind. So that means that everything we can see in Genesis 3, for example, is legend. It's myth. It didn't really happen, but it doesn't matter because it conveys a religious truth. So Adam and Eve have the man that's wrapped up in Right. Or they may have been human, but they may have been like this whole community, and then they just decided to take a couple, and from that on... So there's those kind of views, or the views that, you know, nothing that we see in, um, in Genesis 1, the one we just read, is necessarily historically accurate. These things did not happen in that order or anything like that. Um, and just religious does not necessarily mean inaccurate, so that's what 
Right. So, but, but they, that's what I'm saying. You set it up as a pole, as a dichotomy. Those who claim to, for it to be religious, those who claim that, uh, that there is something historical in it. Maybe I could have said non-historical or historical. Maybe that would have been better. So I'm going to go ahead and erase these and put up the views that um, are current today. And actually, with one exception, which we're going to look at, these are the views that have been around for quite a while. So the very first view is one that is commonly called six-day, 24-hour view, the idea that God created in six consecutive days, each of a literal 24-hour view, and it's sometimes called the literal 24-hour view, but we're not going to call it that, and we're not going to call it that because, well, let me, let me call it, let me put it, let me tell you what we are going to call it, the calendar day view. That each one of the days in Genesis is a calendar day. We're going to see that when we say that each of those days, because that's really what these arguments are all about, what's the length of the days? Each one of these days is a literal 24 hours. By, uh, now, you probably think you know what you mean when you say it's a literal 24 hours. But the very word literal already does something that you never want to do in argumentation, which is you take your conclusion and you put it up as as evidence. Does that make sense? Now if that, now if that is something you're saying, oh, how can using the word literal, we'll explain that. So just hang on to that. We're gonna call that the calendar day view, the view that each one of those days is like a day on our calendar. The second view, and by the way, this view has been around for a while. The second view we're gonna simply call the day age view. It's the view, and we'll expand a little bit, that every day in Genesis 1 actually represents an age, an indefinite period of time. Okay? The third one is something called the framework view. It's become very, very popular. The framework view claims that there is no historical information being given in any kind of detail, although it believes that it is historical, that these things really did happen, but that Genesis 1 is not trying to convey any scientific information and presents the account in a literary framework, not a literal framework, literary framework, so that we can understand it, and we'll unpack that a bit. And the fourth view... This is the new one, by the way. We'll put a little asterisk or something by it. It's been around for less than 100 years. And then the last view that is acceptable in our circles is that the days are analogical. That is to say, they are analogs. They are not literal days, but they are analogs of our work days. And we'll defend that view as well. We'll look at those. So these four views are traditionally uh, allowed. If you um, uh, come before the session as an elder or a deacon candidate, or if you are a pastoral candidate coming before the presbytery, these views would be acceptable if you can defend them whichever one that you hold on to. Uh, by the way, not only is the view important, but now we have a thing called the view of the views. There are some folks who are beginning to say that n this is not acceptable, that only one can be acceptable. And of course, it usually comes down to this one. And one of the reasons for that, and I think it's important to note, is that as things soften in the church, as we become more and more liberal, progressive, as people get away from things, sometimes our knee-jerk reaction is to tighten things up and to tighten things up more than they need to be, to be wiser than the Holy Spirit and go beyond in some of that. So some of the folks who are not realizing, they are the ones who will say it's a literal six-day, 24-hour, and so that's exactly what the Bible says, only this view is defensible. Everything else is on the slippery slope. Uh, they ignore history. They ignore that these views, these two at least, are ancient and, um, but you understand why they're trying to do it, but it's never the right reaction to overreact. 
and we've been seeing that since about the, the turn of the century, so around the year 2000. Interestingly, the PCA, our sister denomination of which this church used to belong, 2000 came out with a whole study report on the day on the views of the days. They listed, you know, these. They listed some of the minor ones, and they expounded them and so on. Said these are acceptable, and they talked about the rise of progressive theology forcing people to to say hey look like for example i mentioned theistic evolution some people are trying to add that to this list of acceptable things so in order to combat that let's just say this is the only acceptable view there's another uh, reason that the pca um, report puts out and by the way the opc came out with a sister report uh, corresponding report in 2004 which really i hate to say didn't add anything to the in fact they quote half the time from the pca one but there they're both worth having. You can find them on either website. Very, very succinct. And you might say, well, how is 60 pages succinct? Well, it is, uh, given that, you know, it gives time to each view and so on. But, um, but in the PCA paper, they note it's not just the rise in liberalism, but it's the rise in homeschooling, which is a good thing, as it says. But a lot of homeschooling material only presents this view, and so parents are only exposed to one view and then begin to think this is the only view that's allowed. So uh, then the other thing is the rise of theonomy, and some of you might know what that is. If not, we'll talk about that some other time. But the rise of theonomy also put this forward as the only view. And so around 2000, remember theonomy had its rise in the 80s, went through the 90s before it kind of petered out around 2000. Uh, but it needed to be hedged in. And one of the things that it also claimed was this. So those things have put pressure and we're going to try to unpressurize that and bring it back to these acceptable views so you guys can see that. All right, questions before we launch into the views themselves? Nope. All right, let's take the calendar day view and let's talk about it a little bit. So the calendar day view, grabbing your Genesis 1, you look at it and you say, all right, it looks at every one of these days, day one, day two, day three. There was evening, there was morning the first day and so on, right? The evening, morning, the second day and so on. So what it says is that what happened here is that God created everything in sick and if you were there with a stopwatch and you started going 24 hours would go by for that day one and 24 hours would go by for day two that would probably be 23 hours 56 minutes and whatever because you know that's actually what it is but we're going to round it up and just say 24 hours so you would go there so it's a literally 24 hour day so that's the claim that each one of those uh, happened in that time frame. Uh, again, guys, just remember my watch broke and I still haven't found any jewelry store anywhere near where I can get to a new battery. So I'm relying on you guys. Where are we? Uh, okay, so we got 15 minutes, plenty of time to uh, at least crank out the calendar day, day view. So that's that view there presenting in the most narrow, in, in the most simple sense. It just simply says each one of those is what today we would say is a calendar day. And there are some strengths to this view. Uh, on first reading, it seems to be obvious, right? How many times have you heard that? Well, it's obvious, it's talking about six days. And when you say day, a day means a day. And so therefore it's six days and those are literal and those are really 24 hours. Uh, so that's the great strength of that view. There's other strengths in that view in that it treats the text as historical, as it actually says, what it means, you know, or means what it says. When it talks about God creating, it really means God created. It isn't myth, it isn't legend, it isn't uh, um, a metaphor, it isn't parabolic, it is historical. So that's one of the great strengths of the calendar day view. It really means what it says. Things really happen. You can have trust in what it actually lays out. And those days are 24 hours, and they are consecutive and sequential. Maybe I should have said that, because some, some people later will say that the days may not have been consecutive, or they may have been sequential. These are views I'm not going to get into. Like there's an interim day views that says they're each one calendar day, but in between, see, it's a concordist view. Remember concordist? Concordist view tries to match and says, uh -huh. okay, so there really is day one, and it really is 24 hours, but then it might have taken millions of years after that before day two starts. 
there's nothing in the text that suggests that. In fact, the Hebrew is very clear. Hebrew, by the way, is very geared towards time. And it's, it's grammar, and God chose the Hebrew language for reasons like this. But in its grammar, it actually conveys time very clearly. You know, we use the word and and those sorts of things, and they have time connectors. The Hebrew connectors are stronger. And when you read uh, Genesis 1, very clearly those connectors show sequence and consecutive. One follows the other immediately with no gaps in between. So these are the great strengths of the calendar day view. Um, is that a question or are you just waving or just, just saying hi? Okay, hi. Um, great. Um, so what are the weaknesses? Okay, the weak... Uh, oh, question? Hand? I'm sorry? It's unprovable. Unprovable. Um, okay, so you're coming at the text saying that it has to show some kind of scientific accuracy that can be proved. I, I'm saying that the Hebrew Cantonese said that it's more accurate than a different view because there's no way that it could have been there to find it. Okay, so you've raised up something very good. Uh, can we prove it? And there's no way that we were there. That is absolutely true. And because we were not there, we're relying on what God says. We were there at the very end, but we didn't see all that. And now you've hit on something which is the creation account is extraordinary. And I use that word not in the way we say, wow, that's extraordinary, but truly extraordinary. It's not ordinary. So I'm going to ask you to hang on to that, and we're going to get to it. Uh, but no, the great strength that I'm saying is that it, it claims that it's historical, that it actually happened. Whether we can prove it or not is a question. But, oh, and I did forget to say one thing they say is, so, so six days, literal 24-hour calendar days, it's historical, consecutive, sequential. They also, now, this is not part of the view in and of itself, but 99% of all calendar day people also believe in something called a young earth. And as the earth is very, very, very young, like 6,000 years old young. Not the earth, the whole universe, everything is. Okay, so you don't need that. You can hold to the, you can hold to the, maybe the, the earth, uh, the universe being 4.6 billion years of age, like they're claiming today. You can hold that and still say that those six days at the beginning were calendar days that if you had your stopwatch, but the vast, 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 vast majority of calendar day people are young earth creationists. And it's technically not part of the view, but it does enter into its promotion and so on. Along with that is the idea that they believe they're on the scientific spectrum, that there is science being presented in the text. That what it's saying is not only historically accurate, but it can be scientifically examined and understood. And for us to take that claim and look at it, which we'll do as we get to the end of these, will require us to actually step onto the ground uh, that Evelyn brought up, which is, are these days, is this an ordinary time or is it an extraordinary time? We'll get to that. So there are some weaknesses with this view, just to kind of begin to raise some doubts. Um, when we talk about calendar day, the word in Hebrew is the word yom. Does that word mean just a 24-hour day like we think of, right? Monday is a day, Tuesday is a day. Is that what it means? So if you take a look at Genesis 1, take a look at verse 4. Let's just start in verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now this view claims that God created light, and he really meant what he said. And so this is actually God doing this historically at that point in time. So it's the first thing that's the claim. I think they're right. Historically, this, this should be correct. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. All right. Verse 5, God called the light, what? Day. And the darkness he called night. And there was morning, and there was, uh, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. In verse 5, the word day is used twice. Look at the second usage. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. How is the word day being used there? It's capitalized in the Yeah, it is. I don't know that. That's just because he's giving him a name. Day, night. But the last one, there was evening and there was morning the first day. How is the word day used there? 
as a calendar day. That's exactly right, Wendy, as you know, tomorrow is a day, the day after that is a day, right? But the first use of day, the one that as Daniel pointed out is capitalized. He called the light day, he called the night, he called the darkness night. How is the word being used there? Hmm? Like as a noun? It, absolutely, a noun. And I'm sorry, I heard another? Descriptive, Descriptive of what? what, if, what if daytime, daylight, daylight. See, even we use the word daylight, daytime. We're using the word day. It's no different. That portion of the, of the calendar day, there's a portion of the 24-hour calendar day that is lit up by the sun, and there's a portion of the calendar day that is not lit. And the portion that is lit, he called day. And the portion that was not lit, he called night. We still use that, lang that, that uh, language today, don't we? That terminology today. The term day has just been used in two different senses. In one verse. Now, let's turn to chapter 2, the very end of this account. And on the seventh day, in chapter 2, verse 2, on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done, and he blessed the seventh day and made it holy. The seventh day, how long is it? Does anybody know? <laughs> say again? It depends on if you ask a Hebrew or not. Well, indeed. So what would they say? Uh, uh, sunset to... Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. That's not what I'm getting at, though. I'm not getting at when it started, but how long is the seventh day? Since creation. Since creation. God had rested on the seventh day, and we are, as, as the author of Hebrews and others tells us, still in the seventh day. So is the seventh day, in that use, a calendar day? No, it's being used in the way that we talk about, well, in the day of Nero, right? In the days of Claudius the emperor. It's an age. It's a period of time, right? And in fact, if you keep reading, verse 4, these are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. The whole, the whole six days are now called in the day. That's the same usage of day as broader. So in chapter 1 through the first four verses of chapter 2, the word day is used in three different ways. Are all those the same Hebrew word? Yes, they are. Absolutely they are. Which means this has got some explaining to do. It also shows the seventh day Adventist. Maybe times they use that in their title of that. Well, they use that primarily because, um, uh, let me hang on to that when we get to the analogical days. It has to do with the Sabbath day, uh, absolutely. So we'll, we'll touch on it, probably not today, so maybe you might need to remind me next week. But let me explain that there, it'll fit, fit a whole lot better. Okay, so you can see that. There's Then another thing you've got to wrestle with, um, how do we know what day is a day? How do you know when it's daytime? When you, how do you know that it's Sunday and not Monday? The sun. Does it even talk about that in the text? Yeah, day four. What does day four say? God created what on day four? The sun and the moon and the stars. And why did he create the sun and the moon, it says? Say again? Yeah, to distinguish what? And to mark out seasons and years. The only way, none of you, this is now, if you want to look, talk about scientific, none of you know time without reference to something. It might be the reference of that little hand going, but it's only as that does what it does that you're able to look at it. Uh, it's always in reference to the passage of something else. So as the light cycle and the night cycle come, that tells you something. And as the weather comes and, and you know, harvest and all those different things, that tells you something. All that comes from the, so if that's created on the fourth day, how did we mark the first three days? Again, I'm not saying that these things knock down the calendar day view, but it's not as obvious and as literal as people think. Okay, so I'm told that we're almost out of time, so that's good. Next week, we're not going to do the whole recap like we did today. We'll just jump into these. But any questions about what we looked at so far? Are we good? So I want you just to see the calendar day view is very... Uh, it's a strong view. It has biblical warrant. 
but it has some explaining to do on those fronts. How do you explain the extraordinary character of the first three days? Oh, there's one last thing I'll sneak in. Um, and we'll get back into this. So this is just to kind of raise some more ways of thinking about the text. When, when I was saying the word literal, the problem with the word literal is this. Um, how long is a day? 24 hours, okay. So there's 24 hours. How do you measure an hour? Huh? Five minutes. Five minutes, six minutes. So, but, but how do you come up with all that? Someone you say, well, a, a watch ticks. The watch, we didn't find a watch ticking and say that's 24 hours or that's a minute or that's an hour. We programmed them, we designed them. So where do we come up with that? We came up with that by watching the sun. Now, if you live in, um, I don't know, the days of the Romans, okay? If I had a stopwatch, a modern stopwatch, it's, 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 in fact, it's so modern, it doesn't even use Swiss timing. It uses a cesium clock. It's an atomic clock, okay? So it's, it's as accurate as anything that we can, we can have. Or go into the future and get a Star Trek clock. And we're gonna measure this thing. It's as accurate as it can be. Here's the problem that we have. If you were living in a day before clock time, and that's what it's actually called, clock time, and you were measuring hours. When we read in scripture, Jesus was uh, crucified on what hour? Okay, I'm hearing third, six, and so on, and then, right, he's crucified at, at noon, dies at three. The Romans call, um, they, they, they start at what we would say is roughly 6 a.m. That's their first hour, and then it goes in so that noon is the sixth hour and the twelfth hour is day. The idea is of a perfect day that starts exactly at six in the morning and six p.m. But it's not actually how it works because we know that in the summertime, those days are longer, right? You have less night but much more day. And now in the wintertime, those days are shorter. If you had a sundial, your sundial is measuring that movement of the sun. Guess what? It still has 12 hours. But those hours are shorter in the winter than they are in the summer. Is that not the case? So if you were there with your CCM clock, in the winter solstice, December 21st or 23rd or whatever it is, has changed several times. Now I forget which is the real one. I think it's the 21st. So if you're there on the December 21st and in a, in a pre-clock time culture, your hour would be maybe 40 minutes. You see the point? The point is it's not as literal as you might think. Why is it a 60 minute hour? You see the point I'm getting at? We are importing our views of clock time which are only about 300 years old into a text that is 2000, uh, 3,000 400 years old and is talking about things that even went further back than that. Sometimes we have to take a step back and realize that most cultures, even in the world today, do not work off of clock time. They work off what's called personal time. If you ever bought a Turkish rug, you know what I mean. You know what I'm saying? Because it's all based around personal interaction. And the time of how long it takes something is all based on you said hi to that person and then everything that follows after that is all. So clock time is a modern importation. And that is why, and I'll end with this, the calendar day view, as strong as it is, has only been argued about in terms of all these you know, views ever, only for the last hundred years, ever since evolution started challenging their views of science and so on. Then people began to really worry. But before that, even those who believed in the calendar day, they weren't sitting around talking about hours and literal and this and that. So that's something that we're importing and we have to, make, we have to decide whether somehow God wrote the text in a way that did not make sense to people until we got to the industrial era with our clock time and only we can really understand it. And you can guess that my answer is no. Or maybe we are importing something into the text that's unnecessary to have there. And that's where I say yes. You can still have your calendar day view, but you just gotta be very careful with that whole literal 24 hour. Okay, we're gonna end it with Timothy's question or comment. Well, I, I guess you, you hit on it in that last statement was, you know, whether or not you're dealing with Roman time period or, or, or even um, Turkish time period, you know, the, 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 the
uh, <laughs> uh, the personal time. We're still dealing with yesterday being the day when the sun was up that time, yep. and then tomorrow that time. So the calendar view versus you know, 24 hours, uh, 18 hours, whatever we're dealing with still does have a, a linear calendar. Style. Absolutely. It's sequential. This view is still sequential, right? It's still consecutive. In other words, not just one follows the other in order, but one day after the other. And there's no doubt that a day is still a day. And if you were there and you measured, you would still have 24 hours in that cycle. The question is whether that's what it's trying to represent and give us that kind of level of detail. I'm not questioning, you know, time has always been, you know, a day has always been 24 hours. The question now is whether that's what we were trying to extract from the text. And I think the answer is no. The view can stand on its own without it, but it needs to be called the calendar day view and to avoid some of the importation of our own uh, cultural biases in order for it to be historically useful through the ages. So, all right, let's leave it there. Um, let me go ahead and pray with us and uh, we'll um, just next week try to wrap up the last three. I don't know if I can do that, but we'll do our level best. <laughs> let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the fact that this majestic text tells us that you did create all things and you created it for us. You are indeed a kind and a beneficent God. And we pray that as we wrestle with what it means, that we would always have a reverent view, like the calendar day view and these others, that recognize that you did truly create and that what you said is really what you meant to say. And we pray, Lord, that we would always have this high view of the text because it exalts who you are and what you have done for us. Help us to see it in that way. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.